But when I was younger, I felt it was okay to run from God. I thought we could have a, a life without God. It'd be just as easy. And as you get a little bit older and as things happen in your life, you find out that it's just not the same. Something's always missing. When I was in my early 20s, I decided to run. And I ran for a long time. I think that the story of Jonah is so perfect because running from God is something we all do. What I've learned is that you can run, but you can't hide. Just don't run away. Run to. Well, good morning. How are we doing 8.30? How many of you just thought you were really early for the 10 o'clock? And... <laughs> uh, welcome to those of you uh, who do not have a clock at home. Uh, we are so excited that you're here. Uh, we are in the middle, uh, actually coming to the end today, of a, uh, of a series that we've been in, in the la for the last few weeks, the last three weeks, on the book of Jonah. Uh, and what we uh, are discovering in the story of Jonah as we uh, wrap this thing up today is that uh, we're just learning some lessons from a guy who ran from God. Uh, that's really the heart of the series. Uh, he's uh, fled for lots of different reasons. Last week uh, ended uh, somewhat abruptly. We paused because we said last week Jonah has some, some what? He has some justice issues with God. Uh, and church is not like a Netflix. Uh, you know, you can't binge watch it. You can't, not like a Netflix. That doesn't even sound right. Um, I'll fix that before 10 o'clock. Uh, it's, <laughs> it's not like the internets where, uh, <clears throat> man, uh, yeah, it's not like Netflix, you can't binge watch, uh, so we're going to pick this up today uh, and look at uh, the rest of the story, but Jonah has some justice issues, is what we discovered last week. He's angry because the Assyrians uh, are not punished in the way uh, that he felt like they should be punished, and God's a God of justice. We believe that. We were taught that deep in our bones. We believe that's true. God's a God of justice, and when we look around at the world, uh, oftentimes if we're honest, uh, we have justice issues with God, whether, we, whether it's in our own life and things that have not worked out the way that they should or in someone else's life when you didn't see justice administered in the way that it should have been administered. There's just this ache. There's this, uh, this ache that we begin to, to carry around. We run for lots of different reasons. We run from God, as we discovered in week one of the series. Uh, we run sometimes just because we, we don't want to do what God wants us to do. But sometimes we run because uh, for, for moral reasons. We, we just don't feel like God is a God of justice. Uh, we look at the way he runs the universe, and it just, yeah, it just doesn't make sense. And so that's uh, where we ended last week. We were talking about some justice issues that we all have, and today we're going to talk about, <clears throat> it's not a trick. Yeah, um, I don't know if you can read that, actually. We're going to talk about <laughs> compassion. Very good, very good. Uh, compassion. If you have a Bible, turn with me. Uh, to Jonah chapter 4, as Nate just read over us. Well done, Nate. Nate will be in the lobby doing confessional. Uh, <laughs> but it's a weird confessional. It's like reverse confessional. Nate's going to be telling you all the things that he's messed up on in the last few weeks. And um, so, so see him. It's a phone booth. Anyway, uh, Jonah chapter 4. <laughs> Jonah chapter 4, uh, starting in verse 1, is where we are going to be together. But to Jonah, this seemed very wrong. Uh, this is the passage Nate read a few moments ago. But to Jonah, this seemed very wrong. Uh, what seemed wrong? He looks at the Assyrians, who were the Nazis of their day. He looks at the king of Assyria, who is the Adolf Hitler of his day. Uh, and there doesn't seem to be justice for what they've done. If you remember from chapter 3, uh, they repent. They say, God, we're sorry. Uh, you get uh, this, this story, an odd story of, of, of uh, sackcloth and people wearing, you know, uh, these ponchos made out of goat hair, sort of a bizarre story. Uh, and, and God seems to relent on bringing uh, this, this punishment to uh, the, the nation of Assyria and to the people of Nineveh. And so Jonah's angry. This seems very wrong. And he became angry. Uh, we said last week that was a darkness. That was this raw that bubbled up inside of him. He prayed to the Lord, isn't this what I said, Lord, when I was still at home? This is what I tried to forestall or prevent happening by fleeing to Tarshish. So he tells you in chapter 4, uh, sort of an odd way in which the writers of the story tell the story. They tell you in chapter 4 uh, why Jonah left in chapter 1. 
Uh, even if you have a hard time swallowing this story, no pun intended, because it's uh, uh, sort of a uh, bizarre and far-fetched, uh, what I want you to discover today, even if you're not a Christian, is that the writers of the Scripture, oftentimes I meet people who say things like, well, uh, I don't read the Bible because it's just not true. And then they get out their Harry Potter novels. Um, <laughs> Even if you don't think the story is true, here's what you're going to discover. There are some profound truths in this story. And uh, just read it. Even if you've never read the Bible or you don't like the Bible or you don't think the story is true, uh, just from a, uh, the brilliance of the writer's perspective, uh, man, the story, uh, they're crafty and creative in how uh, they tell stories. Uh, this is uh, part of their, their literary technique here. He's telling you at the end of the story, uh, why the beginning of the story actually happened. That's why I tried to forestall by fleeing to Tarshish, which is the very beginning of the story. I knew that you were a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love. This might sound somewhat familiar. A God who relents from sending calamity. I knew that you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love. A God who relents from sending calamity. Now, Lord, take away my life, for it is better for me to die than to live. Now, something's happening here in chapter 4 uh, where he says that I knew that you were a God of uh, compassion, slow to anger and abounding in love. Uh, to understand the heart of what's happening here, he's reciting something that's deep in Jewish uh, tradition. It goes all the way back to the book of Exodus. Uh, the, to understand what Jonah's doing here, you have to go back to chapter 1 of the story. In the very first sentence of the Jonah story, uh, unlocks something for us that we discover in chapter 4. So go back with me a uh, couple of pages to Jonah chapter 1, uh, and you uh, read the very first sentence of the story. It says this, the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of who? The son of Amittai. Yeah, the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of of Amittai. Now, in Hebrew, uh, words, names are very, very important, especially in storytelling, uh, or the name that you give to someone is very, very important. And it says that Jonah is the son of Amittai, and the word Amittai in the Hebrew language, it just means truth. Uh, Amittai, uh, the root of that word is emmet, which means truth. And so when you would read this, the first thing you would notice when you pick up the Jonah story 2,700 years ago is this Jonah guy, he is the son of what? He's the son of truth. Yeah, so he's telling you something about what Jonah craves. He craves living in a world that makes sense. He craves living in a world when God says he's going to do something, he's actually going to do it. Jonah craves a world of coherence, a world of truth. He craves that he's uh, the son of truth, uh, is literally what his name means. So as you were reading the story, uh, the whole time you would keep in mind, this Jonah guy, yeah, he's passionate about the truth. He is literally the son of of truth. Now, he's doing something crafty and creative here in Jonah, in Jonah chapter 4, uh, starting in verse 2, uh, where he says, I knew that you're a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. Now, this is a, uh, a prayer that had been recited for generations in the Jewish tradition, uh, still recited to this very day. It comes from Exodus chapter 34, verse 6 and 7. We'll read it in just a few moments. But this prayer, it's, uh, Moses is given this prayer by God, and it's right after the whole golden calf, if you remember that particular story. Uh, way back in the Old Testament, the people of God have built a golden calf, and uh, God is angry about this because he's uh, the Ten Commandments, you're to have no other gods before me, and they worship this golden calf. And so God decides not to destroy the people, and instead he gives them in these two verses, Exodus 34, 6, and 7, 13 attributes of his character. And so this would be recited uh, on the daily if you were a good God-fearing Hebrew boy like Jonah. And so this is a famous uh, prayer that you would recite, and it comes from Exodus 34. Let's read this together. Uh, it says this, verse 6, Then the Lord passed by in front of him. This is uh, uh, Exodus. You don't have to turn there. We'll just read this really quickly. Then the Lord passed by in front of him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord God, compassionate and gracious, 13 attributes of God in this, slow to anger, does this sound familiar? And abounding in loving kindness, and what's the word? And truth. Who keeps loving kindness for thousands, who forgives iniquity, transgressions, and sin, and he will by no means leave the guilty 
unpunished. 13 attributes of, char- of God's character uh, in this. Now, Jonah, if you go back to Jonah 4, he's reciting this. He says, I knew that you're gracious and a compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. Is that part of this prayer? Uh, no. What does Jonah do? He gets four attributes in to the character of God, and he gets to the fifth one, the word truth, and he doesn't say it, does he? He stops, and he says, God, you're compassionate, you're slow to anger, you're filled with mercy, I'll give you that, but don't tell me that you're a God of truth. Uh, You are not a God of truth. I'm the son of truth, So he truncates it. He doesn't repeat the rest of it. Instead, he inserts this idea, God, you're a God who, man, when it came to the Assyrians, you chickened out. You backed down. Uh, You could not handle uh, the consequences of actually uh, following through. God, you you backed down. Uh, You are not a God of truth. Now, what is truth? Uh, Truth, hang with me through this for a few moments. Uh, Truth, it's just an abstract idea. You can't touch the truth. You can't smell the truth. You can't see the truth. Uh, It's just this abstract idea. We believe that it's real, but you cannot uh, touch it, taste it. Uh, Justice is truth lived out in the real world, isn't it? Uh, this is the manifestation of truth. Uh, this is a visible representation of truth. Let me give you an example. Uh, if a judge uh, sentences somebody to jail for murder, uh, it's because there's this, uh, this truth that murder is wrong. Uh, the judge is just implementing justice, just holding that belief that, that murder is wrong, holding that belief up. Yes, murder is wrong. Uh, but without the justice, the, b- the belief, the truth that murder is wrong, it's just this abstract sort of floaty idea. It doesn't mean anything. Justice and truth are deeply connected. Uh, justice is how truth is lived out in the material world. Uh, in, in mathematical or in scientific terms, if you are in either of those fields, you understand this far better than I do, but what do you look for? You look for truth. Uh, and truth, uh, it, it comes down to cause-effect relationships. In physics, for example, every action has a what? Has a reaction. Yeah, you look for the reaction. You look for the opposite. You look for the, for the next thing. Uh, so if you're looking at a reaction, what are you trying to figure out happened? Well, what was the action? That's the truth, uh, this, this, this sort of cause-effect relationship. Uh, that's, that's how the truth works. In uh, injustice, the same uh, is true. There's, this has happened, therefore this must happen. Uh, in, in the case of Jonah, the Assyrians have done something wrong. That was their action. Uh, they did something terrible, and uh, God has no reaction Uh, There is no response to this. And so uh, Jonah is angry. You're not a God of justice. Uh, You're not a God of truth is essentially the proclamation that our boy Jonah is making against God. Uh, He's angry. Now the question is, this is Jonah. He's a bit of a tough cookie, isn't he? Uh, if, If you're God, what do you do? Uh, what you don't see from God in the scriptures is somebody getting upset and ranting against God and God, you know, on his heels going, ah, I guess you're right, Jonah, you know. Uh, if you're God, what would you, I would give like a sermon back to Jonah. Like, you want the truth, you can't handle the truth. Yeah, I would, <laughs> I would load the bazooka back at Jonah. But God's not going to do that. He instead is going to teach Jonah a lesson Uh, through this rather bizarre experience. If you keep going in the story, uh, Jonah chapter uh, 4, starting in verse 4. So Jonah, again and again, uh, what you see throughout the story, I would rather die than live in a world that doesn't make sense. I would rather die than live in a world that doesn't make sense. No justice. Uh, I am not a happy camper, Yahweh, is essentially what he declares. Verse 4, but the Lord replied, Is it right for you to be angry, young Jonah? I added the young Jonah. Verse 5, Jonah had gone out and sat down at a place east of the city. So he's still in Nineveh. Uh, If you remember from last week, he's marching through the city, proclaiming 40 uh, 40 days, and and you're going down. Uh, There he made himself a shelter, sat in its shade, and waited to see what would happen to the city. 
Uh, so he has shade. He already has shade that becomes important in just a moment. Then the Lord God provided a leafy plant, which is a gourd of some kind. It's a perfect story for Halloween season. And made it grow up over Jonah to give shade, which he already has. So he doesn't need this. Uh, God just gives it to him as a gift for his head to ease his discomfort. And Jonah, I love this guy, was very happy about the plant. Uh, now he's all smiles. But at dawn, the next day, God provided a worm, just divine torment for poor Jonah, which chewed the plant so that it withered. When the sun rose, God provided a scorching east wind, and the sun blazed on Jonah's head so that he grew faint. Man, this guy's dramatic. He wanted to die. And he's, how many of you in the face of the Santa Ana winds are like, oh, I'd rather die than deal with it. Just, man, does this guy need God? And like, oh man, just so many layers of problems. He needs a therapist too. Um, he wanted to die. And he said, it would be better for me to die than to live. But God said to Jonah, is it right for you to be angry about the plant? It is, God. And I'm so angry, I wish I were dead, uh, is his <laughs> response. <clears throat> Man, a bit of a passion for botany, uh, our fellow Jonah. Uh, so in, in chapter 3, chapter 4, uh, you didn't punish the Assyrians. I'd rather die than live without, without justice in the world. If the world doesn't make sense, I don't want to be in it. Uh, <laughs> chapter 4... The plant dies, uh, I would rather die than live without that leafy plant. Um, man, touchy, uh, Jonah. Uh, now, the quite, what exactly is happening here? Uh, God gives Jonah this gourd, this leafy plant, uh, for no good reason. He doesn't need the shade. He already has shade. It's what? It's just a gift. Uh, for no good reason, God has just given him this gift of this particular leafy plant. For no good reason, a worm comes along and destroys this beloved plant of Jonah, which he's only had a relationship with for about a day. So uh, he, he has attachment issues. But he, uh, yeah, for no good reason, you're going to take my plant. I would rather die than live in a world where for no good reason, something so beautiful as that plant could just wither away. Now, the question is, what in the world is going on here? Uh, a little uh, background on the passage. In the story, the, uh, the plant is a picture of the compassion of God. The plant is a picture of compassion. Uh, it's given to him as a gift. He hasn't earned it. He doesn't deserve it. In a world of justice, does the plant exist? No. Uh, in a world of justice, the plant, no, it doesn't exist at all. It's purely a sign of God's compassion. We find out later uh, it sprung up overnight, which means it doesn't have a seed. Uh, so it's just a gift that God has presented to Jonah. The worm is a picture of justice. Uh, the worm is a picture of this justice that the son of truth, Jonah, craves so deeply. And the worm essentially looks at the leafy plant and says, show me your building permit. Uh, do, do you have a right to be here? If you don't have a seed, if you, if you just sprang up overnight, then you don't deserve to be here and you're gone. You, do, you have not earned your place in this world. And justice destroys compassion. The worm destroys the leafy plant. And Jonah says, I would rather die than live in a world where this is gone. What God is essentially uh, showing Jonah in this particular moment is that compassion cannot exist in a world where justice always happens. If justice always takes place, which is the, the core of so many, for so many of us, the reason we run from God, the reason we walk away from God is because the world lacks, excuse me, this is justice, this is compassion. Uh, justice and compassion walked into a bar. Um, <laughs> in, a world, in a world where justice always wins, 
in a world that always has to make sense, a world in which most of us, if you were honest, you would say, I crave living in that kind of world. We're like Jonah in this story. I want a world where people get what they deserve, where punishment is administered, where reward is given for good behavior. I want to live in that kind of a world. We crave justice. And God is essentially saying to Jonah through this experience, if justice always gets its way, in that kind of a world, compassion cannot exist. Compassion's gone if justice is always going to have the last word, Jonah. What does justice ask? What's the question? What's the focus of justice? Justice essentially says, what have you earned? What do you deserve? In the positive, if you did something good, you have earned a reward. You have earned something good for, for the good behavior. In the negative, like the Assyrians in the story, if you've done something evil, if you've done something bad you get punishment. That's the nature of justice. The focus of justice is what have you earned, what have you deserved? The very nature of compassion is the opposite. Has Jonah earned the leafy plant? <laughs> no, uh, it's just a gift. The nature of compassion is you have not earned it, you do not deserve it, but I'm God and I'm giving it to you anyway. It's yours. And God is essentially saying to Jonah in this particular moment, you may not want to live in a world, Jared, you may not want to live in a world, Jonah, that lacks justice, but I promise you, you do not want to live in a world that lacks compassion. Think of all the things that you have in your life in this moment that you did not earn and you do not deserve. The breath that you just took, uh, did you earn that breath? No, the sunset that you saw coming into church or this morning when you woke up, did you earn that sunset? The sun uh, hitting your skin, the refreshment you get from stepping into the ocean, looking up at night and seeing the stars that bling out the sky at night, all the beautiful things that you have in life that you appreciate. I would imagine if you started counting the leafy plants in your life, you would begin to recognize most of the beautiful things in your life that you have, you have not earned and you do not deserve. And there may be moments of intense frustration where you look around at a world that lacks justice and you go, man, I, I would rather be dead than live in a world that doesn't make sense. And God's response is, yeah, but you do not want to live in a world that lacks compassion. You do not want to live in a world. You could not function in a world where everything had to be earned. You could not function in a world where you were not given all of these gifts, all these leafy plants by God. If you have justice issues with God, if you're angry, if the reason you have run away, if the reason right now you are thinking about running away from God is because you have justice issues, you look around at the world, you look around at your life, you look around at the news, and there is a lack of justice in the world, and something in your heart is beginning to grow cold like Jonah's. God says, hey, instead of focusing on the lack of justice, the only way out of that pit is to begin to focus on the abundance of compassion that has been given to you and been given to me. And if you and I become angry at the lack of justice, if we become angry because somebody did not get the punishment that they deserved, God says, well, at least be fair, Jonah. At least be angry at all the good and beautiful leafy plants and things that you have been given that you do not deserve. If what you crave is fairness, at least play both sides of the coin the same. Uh, the leafy plant is the compassion of God. The worm is a picture of the justice of God. Now, if you continue going uh, in the teaching, if you continue going in the story, uh, justice has a concern. Justice, the, the question of justice, uh, it's focused on really one thing in particular, and it's the past. That's what jo justice is focused on. Uh, if you, uh, if you uh, stole something, and you're standing before a judge, what's his question? <laughs> what's her question? Uh, did you do it? Yeah. Uh, did you commit the crime? 
uh, if, if, you, uh, if you killed somebody and you're standing before the judge, the judge isn't going to say, well, <clears throat> look, maybe you did it, but you're a really good graphic designer and I really hate for the world to lose that gift. No, uh, the judge is only concerned with the past. That's the logic, that's the flow of justice. Uh, did you do it? Uh, in the positive, did you do the good thing? Do you get the reward? In the negative, did you do the bad thing? Do you suffer the consequence? That's the logic, and that's the flow of a world of justice. God is introducing to the people of God and into the world a different flow and a different logic, and it's the logic of compassion. And compassion is not concerned with the past. Compassion is concerned with potential. What can you become? What can you, what is this going to happen? Uh, I understand, Jonah, you only see the sins of Nineveh, but I see the potential. I see someone created in my image. What can they become? What's going to happen? And yes, I'm a God of justice, but Jonah, listen, I operate, my ways are higher than your ways. My thoughts are higher than your ways. I operate according to compassion with a different logic and a different flow. The Hebrew people, the Jewish people, uh, had a, uh, a deep understanding of compassion. They believed their God was a God of compassion. This was deep in their bones. Uh, it was part of the prayers they would recite. Our God is a God of compassion. And this word compassion in the Hebrew language, uh, it's the word rahimim, uh, rahimim, uh, rahimim. Uh, it's just kind of a fun word to say. Compassion in the Hebrew language, uh, rahimim. In fact, let's just say rahimim. Uh, together, Rahimim. Uh, let's try it on the count of three. One, two, three. Rahimim. Rahimim. Uh, Rahimim. Uh, it's the word compassion. The word compassion, the word Rahimim, uh, gets kind of lost in the transliteration of it, but it comes from this, uh, this Hebrew word, uh, which is Rahim, which means womb. Uh, and so when you would talk about the compassion of God, uh, the root of the word was rahem, and it meant womb. And so to discuss the compassion of God, uh, you would describe God as compassionate, yes, but what you really were saying was God is what? He's womb-like. Uh, God's like a womb. Uh, God, yeah, he, he's, he's like a judge, sure, but he's also like a mom. Both of these are true at the same time of God's character. He, uh, our God is womb-like. Uh, and what does a womb do? Uh, a womb, uh, it nurtures, it fosters life, and it's concerned with potential. Uh, when a baby is born, because obviously none of us remember the, the womb experience, uh, but when a baby is born, uh, what kind of questions do you ask of a baby? What kind of uh, nurturing, mother-like, womb-like questions do you ask? You don't ask questions of justice, do you? You, you don't say to a newborn baby, what have you done to deserve life? Uh, have you earned your place in this world? Uh, no. When a baby is born, you ask questions of potential. What can you become? Uh, even in biological terms, what does the womb do? The womb evaluates uh, every fertilized egg, and uh, if it's not, I don't know a whole lot about this, it'll reject the zygote, is that the right? Um, I've never used the word zygote in public, this is interesting. Um, but it, uh, in biological terms, uh, what does the egg, or what does the, what does the womb do? It evaluates potential. It evaluates potential. And what is God saying to Jonah in this particular moment? Yes, I am a God of justice, but I'm also a God of compassion. Yes, I'm like a judge who sees the wrong, but I'm also like a mom who sees the potential. Some of us in this room uh, as moms, you understand this, that uh, your son or daughter can be in his 800th trimester <laughs> and you still see your son or daughter this way, don't you? You can uh, be called into a, a parent-teacher conference and the, the counselor and the principal and the teacher can be there and everybody can be saying, your son has a problem. Everyone else is evaluating your son or daughter through this lens. Look at what they've done. They have a problem. They are a problem. They're always going to be a problem. But as a mom, what are you constantly asking? Yeah, but what can he become? You never lose sight of this. And God says to Jonah, I'm like that. 
I never lose sight of what somebody can become. I am like a judge, but Jonah, come on, I'm God. I have a different logic and flow. I'm like a womb. I'm constantly, I'm filled with compassion. I'm constantly asking, what can you become? And so he says to Jonah uh, to wrap up the story. But the Lord said, you have been concerned about this plant, though you did not tend to it or you did not make it grow. For someone so passionate about justice, Jonah, man, you seem to be, there is a, there's a fallacy in your thinking. Uh, it sprang up overnight and it died overnight. And should I not have concern for the great city of Nineveh? Um, if you're going to care about the plant that hasn't justified its existence, do you think I'm not concerned as God with the Ninevites uh, and their future and who they can become, in which there are more than 120,000 people who cannot tell their right hand from their left? They're not that bright, Jonah. I'll give you that. And also many animals. He goes on. God, I mean, Jonah, come on. Do you not think that I'm a God of compassion? And the heart behind the story, let me ask you a question. Do you have some justice issues with God? There's something in you and there's something in me that we evaluate one another. We evaluate ourselves. We evaluate the world based on its behavior. It's the only lens that we have. And we begin to develop justice issues with the world. And if you're here, and you're on the fence or you're teetering or you've run away from God because you just don't see any justice in the world. And if you get focused on the lack of justice in the world, God says, come on, why don't you begin to focus on the abundance of compassion in the world? And if you're here and you have a frustration at the lack of justice, why don't you begin this week, just sit down and start counting the leafy plants, all the things that God has given to you that you have not earned and you do not deserve. The breath that you just took, the kids that you hold at night, the things that you possess potentially, the, the sunsets that you see, the moments with friends, so many moments of life, so many, it's a world of abundance in terms of compassion. Your very existence, whether you're a Christian or not, exists because of the compassion of God. You have not earned your existence. And God says, why don't you at least start there, if you're frustrated over the lack of justice, begin to shift your perspective to the abundance of compassion in the world. And you know what I've begun to discover as I do this? <clears throat> my justice issues are deeply connected to my entitlement issues. That there is something in me, I don't know what it is, but there is something in me, and maybe it's something in you as well, that wants to take and say, thank you, thank you, thank you, keep taking, but not recognizing that the things that I'm taking from God are gifts of God. And when I begin to recognize I haven't done anything to deserve any of this, and I have felt entitled to things that are gifts from God, all of a sudden, when I start counting the leafy plants, when I start taking notice of the things that exist in my life that have no seeds, <laughs> that I haven't watered and I haven't tended to. There's something in those moments where the justice issues in my head and heart begin to shrink back. As Christians, and this is what we're gonna do this morning, we always start with the cross. We always begin the very place of the compassion of God, the most iconic and enduring symbol in the history of the world. The greatest gift I would imagine if you're a Christian, you would say that you have is your faith. And it's something that you did not earn and it's something that you do not deserve. And what's so iconic and so beautiful about the cross is the cross of Jesus Christ says to you and says to me, it's, it's this beautiful convergence of the justice of God and the compassion of God. Because the cross says, yes, I see your past, but I also see your potential. The cross of Christ says, I see your sins, but I have not brought justice to you for them. I have not paid you back. I have not given a reaction for your action. The reaction fell on the Son of God, Christ Jesus. And the cross is the place where the justice of God and the compassion of God come together. And the cross is the place where we realize we serve a God who sees our past, but he also sees our potential, doesn't he? 
And when the only thing you could see, when the only thing you do see today is your past, God is looking at you just like he looked at Nineveh and says, yeah, but what can you become? Uh, what is your life going to do? You don't see it, but God always sees it. And this morning, let's take a moment. The starting place, the greatest leafy plant that God has given to you and to me is the cross of Christ. The compassion of God is going to have the last word. The final word spoken over you is not the things that you have done. The final word spoken over you is the compassion of God. Let's thank God for that this morning. Dear Heavenly Father, the cross gets the final word. The compassion of God gets the final word. And you have placed over all of creation, not a leafy plant, you have placed over all of creation, a cross. Every single one of us in this room is held together by it. We're sustained by it. We're given a future because of it. And we have not earned it. We do not deserve it. And for anyone who says that in their life they have justice issues today because they don't see a world of coherence. They don't see a world where people get the things they deserve. God, today your voice says you don't want to live in that kind of a world. We crave compassion, God, deep in our bones, whether we know it or not. And I thank you that the cross, not a leafy plant, is the enduring image of the world, something that can never wither or be taken away, is given to us. And have the last word over our lives, Jesus Christ. And all of God's children said, amen. Grace and peace. cross has the final word. If you're anything like me, I go through a lot of life, and uh, <clears throat> this gets the final word. I don't know for you today, if you walked into church, you're so broken, I heard you rattle in the parking lot as you were walking in. Your past uh, does not have the final word. The cross of Christ blankets over your past, covers your past. The compassion of God, the cross of Christ, gets the final word over your life. As you go through your week this week, uh, you can count the ways, the abundance of God, the mercy of God, the gifts of God flowing in your direction is a reminder that God has not allowed your past to have the final word over you and over me. If you need uh, prayer today, we invite you to come down front. We would love to pray with you, pray for you. If you walked in today, and man, something that happened or something that is happening seems to be getting the final word, seems to have a boot on your neck today. We'd love to pray for you, pray for freedom for you in your life. If you're new with us, we'd love to say hello to you in the blue tent. We hope to see everybody in a couple of weeks at Serve Day. We'll be back here, same time, same place. 8.30 next week, and we'll be kicking off a brand new series. God bless you, my brothers and sisters. May you go in the grace of Jesus and the peace of Jesus. Have a great rest of your week.